Hola, and welcome back, folks, to another episode of the Relationship Schools podcast. So good to have you here. I am psyched that you are the kind of human being that gives a shit about relationships and love and connection. And you're the kind of person, perhaps, that wants to learn more about conflict, communication, and just making this world a better place by being more relationally competent, you know, and capable, especially under stress. So thank you. And as always, thanks to all you listeners for leaving us those awesome reviews on Apple Podcasts. Um, thanks for subscribing to our newsletter. Thanks for being a part of our community. Uh, you can always go to our free community on Facebook, relationshipschool.com forward slash community, if you want to hang with us there and interact, okay? I'm in there posting. I'm in there doing lives once in a while. I'm answering questions. Uh, our coaches are in there as well. They're awesome, and they can help you. Okay, in this episode, I've got uh, our Relationship School Ambassador, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. She's a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University. Uh, she's a licensed clinical psychologist at the Family Institute. She's an author. She's written tons of blog posts for Psychology Today, the Gottmans. Uh, she has her own blog. Um, yeah, she wrote a book, her first book, Loving Bravely, which we've talked about here, um, came out in 2017, I believe. And her next book is uh, just out and it's called Taking Sexy Back. And that's what we're going to dive into today. Um, a lot of this podcast is about women's sexuality. So I'm excited for the women listening. And then guys, I think you're going to learn a thing or two that can help us feel more, um, more supportive uh, particularly around our partners, ex-partners, girlfriends, whatever, uh, future partners, sexuality. So yeah, I'm psyched. Another amazing thing about Alexandra is she teaches a marriage kind of relationship 101 class at Northwestern University. She's been doing it for years. So she works with college kids, teaching them relationship skills. And it's like a sought after class. There's often a wait list, um, and it would be the, like, it would so be the class I would want to have been in, right? Um, so she's married, she's got a couple kids. And uh, anyway, she's a solid human being. And I really love this woman. So let's get right into it. Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, women's sexuality in this podcast. We're going to talk about um, how to really own your erotic essence and um, how the people in your life can support you in doing that. Talk about young women. Um, we talk about a sexless marriage and we talk about other things that you can do to cultivate your, uh, greater sexuality with yourself and others. Okay. Check it out. All right. Welcome back to the show. Relationship school ambassador, Alexandra Solomon. It's so good to be with you again. Yeah. I'm psyched to see you and get into this and get into your new book and relationships and intimacy and sex and all that stuff. So, Alexandra, um, I, I kind of want to start with your new book. Um, it's called Taking Sexy Back. Um, I've started to chip away at it. I have not read the whole thing. And it's the subtitle is How to Own Your Sexuality and Create the Relationships You Want. Can you just give us a, your punchline in terms of what is this book really about and why did you write it? Yeah. So this book is, um, you know, I finished up Loving Bravely and I was pretty excited to have that book in the world. But I, my editors came to me and they're like, so what do you want to write next? And at first I didn't want to write anything because I was tired, but it was, um, I knew, like I sort of, I knew there was a book that was already kind of tapping me on the shoulder, you know, even just kind of mid um, 2017. And then in the fall of 2017, Alyssa Milano, you know, typed the now famous hashtag me too. And that was not her, she didn't coin that term. That was from the early 2000s. Toronto Burke was the first to use the hashtag me too. But that moment that Alyssa Milano typed hashtag me too in the wake of Harvey Weinstein and yeah. all these other sort of men in power, it um, took off, right? And within 24 hours, there were a million, um, a million posts. And so it began this, I think, a new chapter in conversations around gender and power and sex. And then the tapping of this book became more insistent because where I wanted to add my voice is if we're going to start to do the really important work of 
naming the pain associated with sex, the mm. misuses of power yeah. and gender privilege around sex, I also want us to be imagining another world. Like, what do we want? If totally. we're going to start naming pain, what do we want to create? What are the possibilities? And so this book is really just a, a, a you know, a stone on that larger like pathway of where we're going, where I hope we go. And this book is really an invitation to a, a, a reader who's been socialized in the feminine to do the really radical thing of figuring out how the heck to locate her erotic self inside of her. Mm. And that that is subversive in a world that feels wholly entitled to tell women who and how to be sexually oh thought oh. with the Super Bowl, right? That was just like one snapshot of uh-huh. everyone feeling like they can just add their voice and commentary on, on women and their bodies and their expression of their bodies. And so this book is a really rich integrative because you know that you and I like to sit in all of that, <laughs> all of that complexity and turn yeah. the kaleidoscope this way and that way. And that's what we're doing in this book is just looking at how do we quiet all the outside noise and start to listen from within of who is, who is this part of me? What does this part of me need to know? What does it want to tell me? Um, so it's really couples therapy between a woman and her erotic self. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of questions about this, but I, I just want to tangent for a minute because you mentioned the Super Bowl. What are, what's yes. your take on that? The, the JLo just like, and, and everybody's response to it. Yeah. I mean, I, that to me is the most interesting. What I want is for everyone to take their reactivity and pause and use it as an invitation to spiral inward. Like, okay, so if that's my reaction, why? What are the stories that inform that reaction? What are the beliefs that uphold that reaction? Yeah. So rather than taking the reaction and going outside of ourselves to post it on Facebook or you know, whatever about it, to use it as a point of inquiry. Like, why? Why is that my reaction? Because I think there's a lot, lot, lot. It's basically like a Rorschach test, right? Absolutely. However we react to it is an invite into self. And I, in terms of my own reaction to it, I think it's very problematic for white people to be commenting on dance that is informed by cultures that are not white cultures. Yeah. I think it's probably, I think I love the celebration of midlife and motherhood and strength and beauty and culture. So to me, I was just like, Oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> and what, what, um, what was the predominant reaction that you saw people take? Yeah. I'm Particularly curious maybe what yours... women too, because you know, it's, I don't know. Yeah. Just I'll leave it at that. Right. I'm curious, you're kind of like what you're, um, you're part of the part of the world as well. But I mean, to me, it was a lot of celebration. Um, I think I, I'm surrounded by, by a lot of voices that see the world the same way. The, the critiques I read were often about, um, like somebody had shared that now when she goes, whenever her six year old daughter walks past the pole, she dances on the pole, which is a six year old doesn't know how to eroticize that style of dance, right? To yeah. her, she just saw this incredible woman doing things with the pole that are just athletically amazing. So we don't yeah. need to problematize that. And I, I, of course, am wanting all of us to be really thoughtful about sexualization of children and things like that. But I don't think that was the, I don't think that's what needs to stand out to yeah. us about that, about that show. And I think we can, as parents, um, support celebratory dancing without it, you know, without feeling like we're somehow promoting whatever. Yeah. Childhood I, yeah. Thanks. I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, I, I thought it was, I mean, awesome in that I just like people courageous enough to express themselves through dance and movement, um, song, whatever it is. And, um, it is, uh, I just like, I'm kind of with you in that, like the, the reactivity is an invitation to go inward. So I'm appreciating that reminder yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. to just, it's so often the default setting, right. Is to blame and judge. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's interesting because of the Me Too movement and, and what you, everything you said before that about us men or culture telling a woman how, how, how it goes with her sexuality. And you're sort of saying, no, we, this book is, and my message here is about inviting a woman inward to, to rediscover, reclaim, tap into whatever term you want to use to, to uncover her sexuality. What, what is her unique erotic expression? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that and that that process 
especially for a woman who has a male partner, that process of turning inward doesn't need to be a turning away. It's a turning inward in order to foster connection with self that then creates the foundation for connection with other. Because if I don't have a grounding in my own erotic energy and I'm sexual, my sexuality is, is an expression of duty, obligation, right? It's it's habits, patterns. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's a performance. Yeah. Um, versus uh, versus an expression of something that is truly intimate, right? Intimate in that it's an intimacy with myself that I'm then inviting a partner into. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I love that because so often we find ourselves in the bedroom in um, doing what either was we watched on porn or we had an experience before and we're trying to, you know, just regurgitate some some pleasurable experience we've had. But rather than, I mean, really what you're saying I think is, is pretty unusual, which is to go inside and like find out what, who I am here. Right. And then bring it to you, bring it to the other. Yeah. That's kind of what I hear you saying. And and it ties into your, a lot of your teaching around and message around relational Mm self-awareness. Can you unpack that a little bit just so the listeners have a reminder what that is? Sure. Yeah. So if, so the first book was about relational self-awareness. So loving bravely is about relational self-awareness, which is this idea that, my own willingness to practice a um, curious and compassionate relationship with myself, my willingness to explore my relationship to relationships, then sets me up to create the conditions of a healthy relationship with a partner. Because otherwise, I'm going to end up in one of two places. One is blaming. So all the finger pointing that comes from my inability to understand my role in a dance or a pattern or I'm going to end up in shame, which is me just feeling like I'm too damaged, too broken, too problematic, and sort of retreating and walling off. And we know that we can't create intimacy um, when shame has has taken root. So yeah. what relational self-awareness is, is, a, is an ongoing practice of understanding the data that lives inside of me and processing it in the space between you and me so that we can both understand what's getting activated. Cause we know in our intimate relationships that we're getting activated over and yeah. over again. And the goal isn't to not have the reactions. It's just to figure out how to manage them with just a bit more grace than we did last time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that reminder. And it's, it's such a, I mean, even it's the same in a, in the bedroom, right? It's, it's, we're not going to just go in the bedroom and have a good experience every time, right? It's going to be complicated. It's going to be messy. It's going to be shameful. It's going to be like, wait, we missed each other here. Someone's going to shut down. Mm-hmm. But none of that's a problem if you're coming in with what you're offering here as a view of like, let's be curious about ourselves and the interplay between you and me. And can we communicate well? And can we have care and kindness uh, toward each other as we as we become more and more vulnerable together? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's, that's what, I, there's such richness in this conversation about sex because it takes, sex is just another crucible, right? It's another exactly. kind of cr- relational crucible that, um, that, that is, we're, we're forever going to be unpacking from, you know, from the time we become aware of our sexuality to, you know, till hopefully to, to the end of our days that that's, we get to kind of constantly experience and re-experience self and other in that way, but it's really vulnerable. I mean, it's oh my gosh, it there's just there's there's nakedness at every level, right? Physical, <laughs> emotional, spiritual nakedness. If we want it to be, I think that's I think probably that's part of why there's a, a push in our culture to make sex be just a behavior uh-huh. because because all of the meanings and all of the nuance and all of what gets stirred in us in the bedroom is can feel rather overwhelming. So I think sometimes it's a desire to be like, no, no, it's just a simple behavior. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I get you off. You get me off. We're done. We feel good. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now can you, if I may ask, um, so feel free to answer at your own discretion here, but I'm, I'm assuming your own journey, your personal journey and your personal story came into weave was weaving into the book or, or you were working with yourself. Can you, is there anything you'd like to share about just your own relationship to your sexuality and, and that relationship with self in service of like coming into connection with other? Right. Gosh, I learned so much writing this book and it's, it like gives me chills as you ask the question. Cause I think I don't, I think I don't even know quite yet what all of what I've learned. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do know is um, my my research team and I 
we would, our, our meeting, so I have, I'm so blessed to work at Northwestern and I have this team of graduate and undergraduate students, men and women, all different sort of backgrounds and orientations to the world. And we would, we worked on this, you know, we, they helped me with every part of this book. And I was aware, um, one thing that stands out is how much grief we sort of all moved through us at different points, um, especially as we were looking at the nature of sex education in our culture and those significant, significant deficits that many of us um, yeah. have and just all of the kind of shame promoting stuff. So there was a lot of like moving grief through around like, why is it this way? And sadness, um, I think a bit like closer to the bone, I think there was my own work in this book around the need for self-compassion mm -hmm. around sexuality really invited me to look at the places in my own erotic expression where I struggle with self-compassion and to kind of foster even more self-compassion there. And that it really does. I, I've been, as you know, I've been married to the same guy for almost 22 years and we have teenagers now. And yeah. so we've been on this, you know, evolving journey together in every, every sense of a journey. And so I think that that's, I know that in writing the book, there's been, I think it has helped me evolve my own sort of um, connection to him, I think has deepened and broadened. And it's been fun mm. to watch, to have him read the book, right? And to sort of learn his own learning and, yeah. and the ways in which this book highlights like what the things that he didn't know about sex and why didn't he know those things. And, you know, so it's been, I think we've opened up new conversations for us. And that's so cool. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's special. some healing there. Mm -hmm. I had a moment too at, um, I was signing a book for a woman who's the mother of a 24 year old. And she said, I don't know. I don't know what's happening in my daughter's romantic life. She said, but I just, I feel like she's really struggling to make choices about what she wants in her life and what she doesn't want in her life. And it like a piece clicked for me. And I was, I was sharing with her that I think when we do this work around our sexual self, because it leads to deeper integration of the whole self, it helps us feel more like there's, there's more integration on the inside of us. And then it mm -hmm. helps us know more clearly what's a yes and what's a no. Mm. So I feel like my teaching and my, I think I bring more of me everywhere I go now because of the wow. work I've done with this book. And I'm clear mm. about that's a yes, that's a no in for this, not in for this. So there's something really kind of like, isomorphic about it's not just about it's about sex but it's also about all of how we show up in our in our lives that's so cool for those of us that are i'm thinking of young people right now that are raising young people or teachers or uh, around teenagers uh, pe people coming into their sexuality uh, what could we do right there uh, about what you're speaking about to help a person know themselves more so that they know what they're yes to and what they're no to and they actually have their own back and they can articulate that like what 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 can we do there? Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm curious your thoughts on this one. Also, um, I think I think part of it is giving people permission to pause and not know the answer right away. Like sort of saying, "I don't know. I'll get back to you." And letting and in teaching um, teenagers that you are you have permission to to stop and pause and step away and then just get quiet mm -hmm. and notice what's going on inside of you and to really honor that. I think we all have ways we can distract ourselves with our phones. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, I think that that's the teenagers are bombarded with input, 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 and everybody telling them what they think they should do. And so it's, yeah. it's yeah. not certainly not too early as a teen to start to practice that really quiet, that ability to get quiet mm -hmm. and notice like, how's my body feeling? How's my, is my, is my chest tight? Is my gut turning? Like, so to start to, to understand, and feel into what a yes and what a no feels like inside of our bodies, whether that has to do with, you know, sex or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it starts from such a young age too. I was thinking about just education. Like, like if there was a way that we could, I mean, we're competing against, you know, pop culture, right. And it's pretty tough uh, to, to kind of <laughs> get in there um, mm -hmm. because the messages seem so much about, um, I don't know, superficial and they're not really, messages around staying with oneself and going deep inside and pausing, like you're saying. So I think it, it, I, I would say two things. One is if we could somehow cut out the noise and the fantasies about how relationships actually work mm -hmm. or how sexuality really is, like just puncture all that bullshit 
and then continue to educate young people about how it actually works. Um, I don't know. There's something powerful about having kids having an orientation, you know, around, oh, it's not that way. It's this way. I'm hearing from a trusted adult, and then I can test that against my own experience. I don't know. Yeah. Those are some thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And the I think there are two different kinds of noise. Like one is the noise all around sort of, you know, I think there's there, in some parts of the culture, there's a lot of pressure on teens and young adults to be pure, right? To not explore sexuality mm-hmm. and no sex till marriage and um, right. the whole like one man, one woman, one partner for life. Like that's an entire force in our culture. And mm-hmm. I think there's another kind of another kind of pressure, which is to be really sexually expressive and to have no shame around sex and to be fearless and to, you know, be, I think we sometimes mix up being sex positive and being really sexually active. And so that's, so Mm. for those, for teens who are in that world where there's a lot of expectation that you really should just be down to do anything. I think there's a way in which it's the two sides of the same Mm -hmm. coin, because in both worlds, there's a, a pressure and externally, driven pressure to either express or not express one's sexuality. And in both of those, in either of those extremes, it's really hard to figure out like, what's my truth? I can see my friends really exploring and, and going yeah. for it, but how would I know if I'm ready and what would be the conditions? What would be the conditions whereby I would really want to be sexually expressive and in what ways and how would I know that? Yeah, exactly. And how do you invite a woman um, through the book or just through your, your work uh, into her getting to know her erotic expression? Like what are some basic steps a woman can take that's listening? Mm-hmm. Okay. So one, um, one basic step is to kind of, I mean, I always start with the past. So really like starting to view the sexual self as a story and um, who was that part of you and what were the early experiences and messages and doing a bit of like storytelling, whether it's through a journal or conversation where you sort of reflect on like what were the early imprinting um, experiences. And then, and then what were those, how did those leave an echo today? You know, Mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's around, um, around fear, like fear that my sexual desire is too much or fear that I'm doing it wrong. And so like, what were those early imprints? Mm -hmm. Um, I think for women in, for women in relationship, like in long-term relationships, um, it's easy to get, I think that like the roles that women take on as caregivers, as wives, as mothers, those roles can sort of um, cloud a woman's ability to yeah. connect with her erotic self. And so um, what might it be like to have permission to like, how do, how does she sort of de-roll and, um, yeah. and remember the, you know, being a woman and what are the pathways out of the role and into her womanhood and what does her womanhood, what is it wanting? Was it, was it yearning for, um, how yeah. might her partner help her make that shift out of one role into another role? And that's, that is for sure a couple practice, right? That's not all that's, her. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. And, and how does she do it without the guy being like taking it personally or being threatened or sh- you know, shutting down into his shame pile or defensiveness? Sure. Can, right. Like, that's right. I want to get to that here in a little bit in our okay. interview in terms of what men can do here. Um, okay, so the, I'm, I'm getting some steps there, and I'm curious also about the young woman, if we were just talking about young people. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's say I haven't had any experience, and I am a teenager, or I'm a parent listening, and I have a young daughter. Um, like, at, at what point is it maybe appropriate, um, good, helpful to teach a young daughter, a young woman, about her erotic expression and how to start to tap into that, express it, et cetera? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I um, came across in my research was when Bill Clinton was president. So this would have been like the late 90s. He had his um, Surgeon General was the first African-American woman um, ever to be named Surgeon General. And she was at some congressional hearing and was asked a question about masturbation. And in her answer, she just said, she didn't say kids should be taught how to masturbate. She she just said masturbation is a part of sexuality. And what happened next is that she lost her job. Yeah. So there is a deep embedded fear of talking to teens about masturbation, where for you, you can't find a sex therapist, you know, (laughs) worth their, worth their weight, who isn't going to tell, especially a woman 
that exploring her own body is vital to owning and understanding her pleasure. Mm -hmm. It just is, especially for a woman who's partnered with a man that heterosexual sexual script is so embedded. We learned it on the playground when we learned about first base, second base, third base and home run, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can sort of know what the steps are, but, um, but it can be really easy in the, in the face of that script to lose the ability to track like how sensation is growing or traveling in my body, how to Mm -hmm. create an experience that maybe lives totally outside of that script because it feels really good to me. What I've learned about my body is this feels really good. And I love when you do that. And maybe that we create this whole, this whole different menu of possibilities that are based on how pleasure moves through my body. And a woman, you know, there's a chance that a woman may not know that if she has been beholden, understandably been beholden to this idea that sex is a service she provides or, or she shouldn't yeah. like it too much, or she shouldn't. Some women have the experience of being really afraid of their arousal, that it that can feel uh-huh. really big and really greedy and really hungry. And women are taught from a very early age how to control their appetites. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, there's so much in here. Wow. Hey y'all, we have an amazing event coming up on conflict. Do you know how to work through conflict? Are you sure you know how to get it done when it's really hard? Do you know how to repair effectively? Okay. We're going to cover all of that. Relationshipschool.com forward slash connected. The uh, super early bird deal is gone April 30th and the price goes up. So now is the chance to get this. Take action now. Check out what Dana said, who came to our event uh, last year. I have been dabbling a little bit in this kind of work and really wanting to show that to my partner. And he decided to join me and watching that has been really exciting for me. We've been together 18 years, married 12, and it's just time for us to work as a team. And I think it was just a place of like being stuck, maybe stuck in a time where we were really young. And as we've evolved, learning tools to get us to that next place together. I feel relief. I feel that I have tools to approach conversations that prior to this weekend I would avoid. I'm just scared about conversations at home. And now I don't feel quite so scared of the conversation because I'm not trying to predict the outcome. I think we all need to understand how to communicate better with our loved ones, with our families, with work. And there's not anybody I know that doesn't need that skill set. Boom. Thanks, Dana, for your awesome participation, you and your guy. Super fun to see you. And uh, yeah, you can be like Dana if you want. Just learn how to do conflict, guys. A uh, couple days with me, it's going to change your life. Relationshipschool.com forward slash connected. And make sure you sign up now or the early super, super early bird goes away. One of the things I just got was, as you described the kind of first base, second base, third yeah. base, and I totally remember that, was how outside in the approach is to teaching really kids, but like, let's say a woman, a young woman about her body, right? It's, if I'm not allowed to explore my body and there's not permission there and the freedom to explore my body, which is kind of inside, starts with the inside, and then I move out from that place because I start to know what works for me, what doesn't work for me. But it's so that, since that's not on the menu, it's outside in. Like, in other words, I'll wait for a sexual experience and it probably won't go that great, maybe in the, in the beginning. And then I'll learn through trial and error, hopefully what I like and don't like. But you know, there's, there's no, I just loved what you said about masturbation and the permission around self-pleasure um, f- first, or even as a practice, um, yeah, that was, there was something about that was really helpful. Yeah. And I don't quite, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like what is so terrifying about yeah. that? Um, and there's a way I think with, I think with, um, you know, free streaming internet porn, I think there's a way in which younger people have kind of normalized at least male masturbation. Yeah. Like that's um, it's sort of assumptive. Yeah. But are we doing the same for female masturbation, you know, with or without um, erotic materials? Um, but what is what's frightening about that? And I think that we are, you know, under a patriarchy, we're very used to women's bodies being regulated. So there's something kind of threatening about a woman bringing herself pleasure. It sort of is like, 
than are men even necessary, which of course, you know, it, it is, it, I think then connection with a partner, whether it's a male partner, or female partner is additive, right? It's additive. It is um, rather than yeah. somehow rendered unnecessary if I can bring pleasure to myself. But I don't, I think that may mm-hmm. be a piece of the fear is mm-hmm. like a woman who is able to stand on her own two feet is, um, is threatening. Yeah, it's threatening. Absolutely. Yeah. And that sounds, it sounds big and dramatic, but it's so fascinating how, how often things that I researched for this book kind of came back to subtle ways in which the order of things gets reinforced. Yeah. Yeah. And then if we bring the male into it, if I'm a young man, um, and let's say I am, I do meet a woman who's somewhat in her power there, knows herself, um, and she might make some course corrections because I'm already in my male conditioning, I'm already supposed to get it right and know what I'm doing. Um, I will instantly, it's going to trigger some inadequacy that I'm not good enough for doing it right, which I'm going to either go into shame, like you said, or blame, right? And then I'm, I'm stuck in that as a man. And I don't, I don't get the permission myself to go slow and explore my body and be, be a student or, or be a co-explorer here. Like it's, you know, it's like, we're so wound up here. I completely agree. I completely, and I think this stuff happens subtly and silently and very quickly because I think a woman in her, I think, I think a woman who's in her power, who senses that her course correction is going to stir him into shame, she will, you know, kind of downregulate, right? She will step oh, back. She yeah. will shrink down. And then he senses that she's shrinking back. And then, it, you know, then it creates another, it's just these dynamics. These little feedback so, loops. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but man. that, you just hit that piece on the head about, we do, we set men up for such problems in the bedroom by giving them this idea that to ask a question, to inquire, to um, request direction and input is somehow unmanly or somehow yeah. shows you are, you're a fool. You're going to, you know, it's, it's, it's to set you up for humiliation. And that's just so tragic. Yeah. What exactly, what can men do wherever they are on the journey to help, help a woman, the woman they're with, uh, find, explore, express her erotic, you know, internal erotic expression. Like how, what can we do to help? I think, I think committing to their own healing, um, you know, going, going through a similar journey around critiquing and questioning the messages that they've been given about mm-hmm. sex. Some of those messages are, I think we, we teach our boys and our young men that their sexuality is inherently predatory and dangerous. And I think that's a really sad message to give boys yeah. and men. It's the reason I hate dress code rules, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. one of the reasons I hate dress code rules is like this idea if she has to cover this part and cover this part, what it's saying to men is to boys is that your sexuality is so wild and so dangerous that you, the world has to be made safe from you. Yeah. So we need to make women change Mm -hmm. and you can just keep being your wild self. But also that, also that yourself is wild versus saying like, you may have really, really strong feelings when you see a bare shoulder. So let's talk about how you can, channel and ground yeah, that strong with. feeling and get yeah. your algebra done, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice. mm-hmm. So yeah. how else? I mean, um, there's certainly, you know, cause I think you have a chapter actually, I just want to uh, name the, the chapter here. Um, yeah, there's the, um, you had a comment about patriarchy and then reflections for men who love women are taking sexy back. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, maybe it was before our call, but I just got the impression that there's, there's more we can do as men to support this process, you know? So one of them I'm hearing is we got to explore our own history, get curious about ourselves, you know, around our sexuality. Um, Yeah. Some of our, again, the messages, especially around performance, that's such a big one for guys. It's Um, such a big one for guys. And I got stuck there for years. It's I'm sure. I'm sure I did a, I was recording a podcast, um, um, recently, and we were on a break, and the guy who was working the camera when we were on break, the guy who was working the camera started talking about his erectile challenges, and he hadn't ta- he had had not talked about it yet, and they were problems. It was a problem that developed for him after being in a hookup, losing his erection mid hookup, and the woman that he was with shamed him. Yeah, she was 
She did not handle it well. Now, she did not handle it well, most likely because she was involved in her own shame spiral about yeah. is this because I'm too this or not enough this, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it okay. And it, and it has lingered with him and haunted him. Um, and he's afraid. And it, and it again is that idea that the heterosexual script rests upon him getting and maintaining an erection. And that is just ridiculous. Like it doesn't need to be right. We, I wish we lived in a world where <laughs> erections could come and go a bit more. And we weren't all so wrapped up in that because it's like, there's su such powerful stories that both sexes will attach to what's happening with the penis in this moment. And it's way, way, it's like narrowing down this entire big, beautiful body that a man has to this one part. You know, it's like focusing on this one part as if that's the only pleasure producing part of a man's body. Yeah. My take uh, lately on that is, is it's just another, it's another hidden layer of misogyny. So if I go quote soft, right. Um, it's definitely unmanly. And if I actually was in touch with the truth, which is my cock is sensitive mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm that, I'm that sensitive to the nuances of how you talk and how you are with me, that's how sensitive I am. Instead of being in touch with that sensitivity, which is a journey I've had to make, I will shame that sensitivity, right? And because I'm, I'm taught as a, as a young boy to shame the sensitivity, be shamed for it, and then not like it in my girlfriends. Like, they, why are you so needy? Why are you so sensitive? Why are you so emotional? You know, mm -hmm. it's just like the list goes on. Um, Man. I'm just gonna sit in that for a while. It's just so beautiful. It's just so beautiful how you said that's just that's such an invitation to healing the masculine. The way you said that. Yeah, I mean, I've had to really learn like that erection is essential feedback for mm -hmm. how tuned in I am to myself and connected, and how connected and tuned I am to you. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, when something else happens, it means something's off. So just listen. But instead, yeah. let's instead of that, guys, I, I know an idea. Let's rob you of your journey to become more self-aware and just give you Viagra. Right, right, that's right. <laughs> just stick a Band-Aid on it and keep on so going. So you never learn. God. Right. Mm -hmm. We're just like disempowering dudes all over the place. And then women end up yes. again paying the price also. It's so. Right. But yeah, even the, I was just thinking as you were saying that, um, this sort of the commercials you can hear on the radio for ED medication where it's just sort of like, guys, you know, we know you hate talking about this. So use this website to get your medicine. So it just, even in that messaging yeah. around, like oh, yeah. we will make it so easy for you that you don't even have to ever even tell anybody that you even have to have this problem. It's yeah. just, so we'll collude with your shame. We'll all keep this a secret. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, lots of economies would crash to the ground if we moved out of shame, right? The whole <laughs> diet industry would crash if women oh, yeah. started being so ashamed of their bodies. Uh, yeah. The pharmaceutical industry would crash. I mean, yeah, it's so true. It's shame is a big moneymaker. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, winding down, maybe a few more questions here. Um, I wrote a couple things down here. Um, yeah, it's sort of like you were saying. Um, in one of these chapters, your feelings are data, right? Whatever's right. coming up between us is just data and we can learn from it. Yeah. And when we, when we shut it down, I think we're many of us, especially there, each of us has maybe particular emotions that we struggle particularly hard with. But when, when an uncomfortable emotion comes up, as you were saying before, our urge is to suppress it or project it or somehow get rid of it rather than, right, turning towards it and um, with a bit of curiosity and humility and, and patience to kind of try to understand what it, what it is. And it makes so much sense that for, that around sex, there are going to be emotions that come up. We, in the, there's a, a chapter about emotion and um, I encourage people to do a, a process where they just pause and check in with their emotions kind of before they are sexual during and then after. And so sort of notice, like, and track what, what that arc of emotion is like and to use that then as data. And I think this is true. I think that can be a helpful practice for people who are both in relationships and people who are dating, right? I yeah. think sometimes we, you know, somebody will ask, like, is it like my college students or even just, or even people way, way older than college will say, like, at what point is it okay to sleep with a new partner? They have no freaking idea. Uh -huh. But I have some ideas about how you might know, right? By tracking your emotions, then you can start to know for yourself, like when, when do I feel ready to be open, and when do I feel more closed, and what helps me feel more open? Yeah, that's great. That internal experience. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, I'm sure you get this question a lot. 
how do people that have been married, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, how do they, what's your advice for keeping their sex life alive? And is it okay to go years without sex? Right, right, right. Right. I think that um, I think the first step is dismantling the idea that if we have to work to cultivate erotic connection, then somehow it's wrong. I think that's that's a, a shift that happens is that oftentimes early in a relationship, there's lots of spontaneous desire. Spontaneous desire is like desire that's driven by sort of like biology, hormones, urges, you know, mm-hmm. just that feeling. Yeah. And it is normative and common that that shifts some for some people a lot for some people a little and it becomes more responsive desire responsive desire meaning that my around my desire is sparked by things in the space between us um how i'm feeling within my own skin that there needs to be a bit more proactive intention around how to stir up my desire and so Mm -hmm. couples um, need to learn how to be in- intentional with that. But I think being intentional about sex, scheduling sex, doing things to create the conditions for desire to come forward, that confronts that highly romanticized idea that sex should just be the yeah. two of us not being able to keep our hands off each other. Right. And that's right. not, generally speaking, what long-term um, couples lovemaking looks like. Exactly. And, and what about the, the sort of no-sex approach? I don't know. I mean, it is. Um, like, is. Are we cutting off a part of our life force if we sort of say, yeah, it's okay. I'll just, I will go, because this is common, right? In, in a long-term relationship, they become best friends. They're, they're um, business partners with the kids. The kids finally leave the home maybe. And it's like, who are we? And what are we doing here? And and at that point, the chasm is so big, it feels daunting, right? So I'm, I'm curious mm-hmm. what you'd say to those couples. Yes. If there's a couple where they have not um, been sexual for a very long time, there's a big chasm that I would want them really quickly to reach out to a couples therapist or a sex therapist and really start to find each other again, doing a couples retreat. Like it's going to have to be an active process to break the inertia that they yeah. have yeah. developed. And, and I hope, I would hope a sort of shared mourning, right? Like sort of a collective sadness that we have, we've let ourselves go and we've, we've lost each other in this way. Cause if we can, if we can be in it together and grieving it together and making a plan together, then that's going to be much more, I'm going to feel much more hopeful for that couple than a couple who is like, yeah, this happened because you stopped wanting it. Right. Yeah. Cause there the story is locked in around blame and whose fault it was. And it's just, it's really yeah. hard to build something from that space. Yeah. Yeah, but I think simple. also I want us to make sure we're using a really broad definition of sex because I think couples can yep. not be sexually active in this way, but still have lots of erotic energy in their relationship, right? Because they're hugging, they're touching, they're dancing, they're taking baths together, they're holding hands. Mm-hmm. So there's there are lots of ways that couples can still maintain a sense of connectivity around their bodies and their physicality, even if there are parts of their sex life that are on hold, you know, like I'm thinking about a couple after a baby or a couple going through an illness together. Like there are ways to kind of cultivate that physicality without, even if this, if, even if our sex life looks different now yeah. than it has before. Yeah. Yeah. It's so great. Okay. Thanks. I think that's going to help some of our listeners. All right. Oh, last okay. question. All right. Two more. Um, sex is kind of a, you said, tra- I think transcendence or um, explain what you mean. Like, what's what's possible here? I'm, I'm guessing you you write about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's there is a chapter about spirituality um, as one of the. So in the book, there the the bulk of the book is sort of this journey through these seven different domains in which the reader is encouraged to. There's there's learning. There's information, but they're also reflecting on like to what degree am I really blocked in this domain versus to what degree is this really an area of strength and flow mm-hmm. and ease. And around spirituality, I think for many of us, this is an area of block because the traditional religions tend to pair sex and shame together yeah. pretty powerfully and solidly. And so that may be a piece of healing that someone needs to do. I, I, I call it a spiritual renovation in that part of the yeah. book, sort of how might they expand their religious beliefs, their faith beliefs, their spiritual beliefs it, it, to the point that shame can be dropped from the equation, yeah. that there's not that God, sex, shame triangle. Yeah. 
Um, and so that nice. so that sex can become infused with with spirituality because it is right when we when we find that space of flow and presence. Sex becomes much like yoga or mindfulness or these kinds of experiences where we leave our, we get bigger than the bodies that we live in, right? Yeah. We tap into something that is, yeah. can't be touched or seen or held, that is just that kind of big, whatever we call that, God or consciousness or oneness. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not every time, certainly, but it's sure. just that sense of like, lifting off the layers of role and responsibility and wound and just being really in this moment. Yeah, absolutely. Such, such a beautiful way to describe it. Cool. Okay. Alexandra, um, I asked you this, I think twice before, uh, just about the young people. And if I had a room full of, um, you know, a thousand teens and you had one thing to teach them about relationship and it had to go through my ear and come out of my mouth, what would you want me to say to them? Hmm. Um, well, because we're talking about taking sexy back, I think what I would say to them is you is to be a lifelong learner about sex. And that I have every confidence, especially if you're in America, that your school system probably didn't, didn't do you right around sex and that mm -hmm. you don't have what you need. You may have what you need to keep yourself free of unwanted STIs, you know, help you around preventing sexual violence, unintended pregnancy, but you most, I can guarantee you don't have what you need to understand um, relationality around sex, joy, pleasure, connection, um, self-compassion. Mm. And so to really commit to just saying, I don't have it all figured out and that's okay. And I deserve more time and more space and more materials to learn about this part of this part of life, this part of being human, the jo is this joy of being human. Yeah. Awesome. That's great advice for adults. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> cool. Where do we find you and where do we find taking sexy back? You find Taking Sexy Back wherever books are sold. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local indie bookseller. It's pretty easy to find. And you find me um, at dralexandrasolomon.com and then on social media, Facebook, Dr. Alexandra Solomon, and then Instagram. I'm on Instagram quite a bit, dr.alexandra.solomon. Awesome. Well, Alexandra, it's so good to see you again. And thanks so much uh, for this awesome uh download really uh, today and then in the book. So really appreciate the work you're doing and uh, for all of us to heal here and grow. Thank you. So good to see you. Yeah, likewise. All right. Awesome. Uh, go check out Action Step here. Uh, go check out Alexandra Solomon's book, Taking Sexy Back. Uh, check it out on Amazon. We'll have a link in the show notes to her book. Um, you can get it at Barnes and Nobles, et cetera. And follow this woman on Instagram. She's on there a lot and uh, enjoy. I think you're going to like this book. Next action step. I want to zero in. There's so many things we could have like unpacked there in our interview, but uh, I really, really feel strongly about um, the lack of sex education for young people and how dropped kids feel around their sexuality. And then they're just sort of left to figure it out, outside in approach. And she actually talks about the inside out, outside in approach in her book, in the first chapter, I believe. So the action step for you is, what is your relationship to self-pleasure? And I think it's cool to, to think about that from the standpoint of, do I give myself permission to have an erotic relationship with myself? And can that inform and enhance my erotic relationship with my partner or future partner? So the very first action step here is just to get vulnerable and journal, you know, three lines, three paragraphs about that. The next action step, of course, would be to share it. So I always have kind of A B, and B of the action step. A is journal, write about it, reflect. B is share it. B is always my second thing, which is share it share this with someone, right? And uh, just talk, be like, hey, here's my relationship to self-pleasure, what's yours? Um, I, don't, I never do it, I shut it down, I made it wrong, I was so ashamed and so I've stayed that way and so I just figured it out. And you know, like there's so much richness here if we dare to get to know each other 
around her sexuality. And I think that's what's so poignant about her book and what her message is here. So can you give yourself that kind of room and can you um, open to another person around this? Do you feel safe enough? Can you create the, the environment that you can go there? All right. I'd love you to do that. Great. Um, and as always, come hang out with us, come play with us here at the Relationship School. We have um, lots of events coming up in April. We, we're on the East Coast at Kripalu, and we are here in Boulder for one of our most amazing weekend workshops called Accepted and Connected. That is probably the spot to be in late May. So mark your calendars. You can get your tickets now, relationshipschool.com forward slash connected. All right, bring your friend for free. Okay, guys, thanks again. Rock on, and we'll see you soon. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Relationship School fans and smart couple listeners, please subscribe to this YouTube channel, all right? Do us a favor, subscribe, share one of these videos with a friend, all right? We want to help the planet get their act together around relationships, and you are one of them, so thank you.